Splat from the Past. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very lovely lady, uh, Clara Gabrielle. She is the daughter of my friend and frequent guest, 80s movie legend Marie Lauren, and also her father is Patrick Hauser, another 80s movie legend. And I'm having her on the show today to talk about, you know, her upbringing with them, how she got into acting and film. Um, <clears throat> she directed a movie with her mother that we've talked about on the show before, uh, The Uncanny. And it's going to be a great conversation, and I can't wait to have her on today. And uh, she seems just like her mother in many ways, so I will find out. So yeah, here is my interview with... Clara Gabrielle. Hey, Clara. Hey, sorry for the misunderstanding. Oh, that's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know there's so many different forms of communication now. It's like, you know, aside from all of this social media and email and text messaging, and there's also, like, which way should we call each other? Yeah, it's fucking insane. It is. It's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> many choices. Yeah. How are you today? I'm good. Um, I, well, you know, it, I've been spending a lot of time cooped up, so basically it's, it's, it's like how it was even before the pandemic, but, you know, being a writer and everything. I um, spent a lot of time at home, but um, this is definitely, even for me, and I think around July when I realized you know, that it wasn't going away anytime soon. That's when it really started to affect me. But the first few months, you know, um, in terms of isolation, I was actually surprisingly fine. Um, it felt very normal to me. I think it probably felt similar to a lot of people who were already working from home, you know? Yeah, I know everyone is just being so affected by this pandemic. I, 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 I always thought we would get to a point where we would be repeating the Great Depression again, but I didn't think it, it was... Hold on one second. I need a speaker phone. Go ahead. You can put it on speaker. No, I... Hold on a second. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, it's just me. I have this... I have this ridiculous new, um... This new, uh, phone case. Mm-hmm. That I really love. Uh, it looks like a... Like a vintage cell phone from, like, you know, the... 80s or something. Yeah. <laughs> but awesome. uh, apparently I can't actually use my phone, the, the calling service, with it because I can't hear what you're saying. So <laughs> if you'll, just, if you'll, if you'll um, repeat what you just said, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about how, you know, I always knew we were going to be back to the Great Depression, but I didn't think it was going to huh. end up like this, though. I didn't think a, a germ would hold us back. I just thought a bad president would. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like everything all at once, yeah, coming to a head. It's, um, yeah, I can't really, you know, compare it to anything else. Everything else, I, you know, that I remember in terms of, like, news and world events and all that, it felt like, um, you know, it was like, this happened, and then this happened, and then later this happened, but now it's like, oh, you know, um, well, all of the historical events, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you okay, you come from two very talented parents. Your mother is Marie Lauren. Thank you. Yes. And your father is Patrick Hauser. Um, yeah. Your mother has told me you're embarrassed by the fact that uh, you were in Steel Magnolias as a baby. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean... <laughs> Not as much anymore, but, you know, I don't talk about it, really. Um, well, you don't really have anything generally. to say. Well, you don't have yeah. anything to say because you you were a baby. <laughs> right. 
right, exactly. I don't have it, it. It doesn't even really feel like it was me because it, there's nothing that I can. There's no like personal memories and reference points that I have. It just is something like a story that people tell about me. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's like you you were like blacked out or something, and people go on about like all the things you did when you blacked out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the things I did. So, w- the things I did w- yeah. d- during my drinking days. Oh God, they, they exactly. were awful. <laughs> like, that was a different life. It was a different me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but what age did you start um, gravitating toward acting in film? So, uh, well, aside from that, because I was an infant in that. After um, I. I went through a lot of different um, school, well, went through a lot of different schools, and I actually, uh, one of the first programs I went through was Waldorf, which is like, it's a school um, that has a very different approach to um, teaching and curriculum and sort of developmental points, um, like child development points. Mm-hmm. And instead of like teaching, you know, reading and arithmetic first thing in like, you know, first grade or even kindergarten, they'll start teaching you like a second language and some, you know, um, how to use a musical instrument, you know, like a recorder or something and um, those kinds of things. And it's a great program, uh, but unfortunately, uh, in my second year there in first grade, I got a really awful teacher who was actually... Uh, abusive to the students, and nine of the students were pulled out by their parents uh, during that winter wow. um, inter- intercession. And the thing is, is that if the way that it works there is that they want you to like develop a relationship with your teachers, so they keep you in. Um, the, the teacher that you get in first grade, you have for like I don't know, like four or five years or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all these students, including myself, were pulled out, and then I was put into a regular public school, and because I didn't know, you know, I wasn't um, in the same, like, I didn't have the same knowledge base as the rest of the kids there, they assumed that I was, I, like, was developmentally challenged or something, and so I was, and I I didn't know how to read, I didn't know how to do any math, and so I I was put in the special ed programs, and, um, and that, of course, like, you know, was a huge um, blow to my self-esteem, and I was um, heavily bullied for it and all of this. And so um, my teacher recommended that my parents put me in an acting class just to kind of get me out of my shell and get me to start um, to build up my confidence again. And I just fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And um, ever since then, uh, yeah, I just, I, I was going to all these different classes. Of, at first it was just like a silly, like, summer camp, not, not even summer camp, just like an after-school camp, and um, it went so well uh, that the, the teacher there, or the, you know, what camp, what a camp counselor or whatever, recommended that, you know, I go to a more um, serious training program, and from there I went to Lee Strasberg. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, yeah. That's amazing. Was, yeah. What's that? That's amazing. So many people have just learned so many techniques from the, the Strasbourg uh, teachings. It is pretty amazing, yeah. It's, um, I think now it's, it's not something that mm. I uh, rely on as much as I used to. I think, like, for, for a long time I was, like, really, really all about method acting and... And it's, it's a, a great approach, but um, especially if you are not, if you're already struggling with mental health, yeah. then it can be detrimental, especially if you're playing <clears throat> darker roles. And um, and I, at a certain point in my life, I was really only being cast in these very, very, very dramatic roles that um, were very dark, and it um, I wasn't getting any comedy, which I love. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even like auditioning for it, you know. Yeah. And um, I just I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. Um, so I eventually found other ways to to approach the work um, that are more sustainable. 
Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, I, uh, how many actors in general, though, are, are crazy? I don't think I've met an actor yet who doesn't have some craziness in them. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. We're definitely different. I think most artists are, you know. Um, you, you just you see the world differently, and if you see the world differently, then you're crazy, right? Mm -hmm. That works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, if you're if you if your world viewpoint doesn't match up with the majority, um, then you know you're yeah you're you're out of the box. Mm -hmm. I uh, did, um, did, did you was there any actors that you idolized growing up besides your parents? Oh, of course. <laughs> um, gosh, I think like one of the first actors I really idolized was Johnny Depp. Oh yeah. Um, I, I was actually really into him before, like, he became, like, a, I don't know, before he became really huge, I was really into him back in the days when he was, you know, he was doing, um, what's mm -hmm. eating Gilbert Grape, and, um, Benny and June, and all those. Yeah. Um, and I loved, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio, and, um, oh, I, I still love that Romeo and Juliet, uh, Bob Lerman's Romeo and Juliet, this him and, and uh, Claire Danes, I think it's just such a a beautiful film, and they everyone in, in there is like amazing performer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm a guy who loves Tom Hanks, and I love um, James Woods, Gene Hackman, Jack Nicholson, great great legendary actors like that. Mm. Yeah, you know? Jack Nicholson is amazing. He he's he just has like a De devil, I don't know, like this sort of devil may oh. care, yeah, devil may care attitude. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, it's so much fun to watch, you know. It's, yeah, it's such a joy. I think that's um, that's something that all um really amazing performers have is that you know, aside from whatever sort of technique or style they have, this like just this joy that um that they bring to it, and and not and that the audience is able to derive from watching it. Therefore, like if you if you ever watch somebody who obviously, you know, when you watch someone who hates what they're doing, yeah. <laughs> it's just never going to be, um, or or isn't it like really enthralled by it? You know, then they're never going to be um, as entertaining to watch as as someone else. You know, who is, uh, yeah. and that makes a a huge difference. I think and it's not something that people really talk about, but um, but yeah, it it informs I think how how um, your work is perceived and and received, and um, in the end, like how how far you end up going, you know. Yeah, I think they hate the material more than the actual job a lot of the time too. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it is a material thing. I think um, sometimes it's also maybe you know, but it's like I don't know. It's very easy to to like the work, but like you know, you hate the business or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of it, of course, is just business. So exactly. <laughs> if you can't get over that, then then um, it can seep into into the parts of it that that you do love. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any of your uh, parents' old movies? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have seen. Well, are are you thinking um, particularly of a uh, creature? Creature, yeah, and uh, talking yeah. walls. And which one? Talking walls. Talking walls. I I saw a weird cut of talking walls. I I don't think I've ever seen the full version, but I I thought it was actually a very sweet and and fun little indie project. Um, yeah. Yeah, I quite liked it. Um, of course, in um, Three's Company, I saw the episode that my mom did on that. Classic, and, classic. I love that episode. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my father's um, hot, hot dog. Hot dog uh, and weekend, yeah. pa weekend Pass. You know, I, I haven't seen Weekend Pass. I definitely haven't seen all their work, to be honest. It, you, uh, you know, there was only so many of their projects that they kept around. Yeah. You, <laughs> um, <laughs> probably, probably for the best. 
Um, you would but, like you would like Weekend Pass. It's it's got a real um, influence of what later became Apatow movies, Judd Apatow movies. Um, oh, really? Yeah, it's got this mixture of raunchy comedy with heartfelt emotion. Uh, because these guys are, you know, they're in L.A. for the weekend to get laid, and they end up falling in love instead. And there's some really good moments in there, and your father's got some great moments in that movie. Wow, okay. Well, I'll definitely see if I can get a hold of a copy of it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Probably only on, like, VHS or something. <laughs> oh, yes, I have it on VHS, and I, 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 I talked to... Okay, I talked to uh, Tracy Smith from Hot Dog the Movie, and she told me your dad was a real sweetheart. Uh, she enjoyed uh, working with him. And then um, uh, two of his sailor buddies in Weekend Pass, Chip McAllister and Peter Ellenston, told me that um, he was very standoffish with them, and he was bragging about Hot Dog the Movie and how it was going to make him a huge star and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's four of them, right? Four sailors, and he was the only one who just didn't hang out with the guys, and it was the, the other three, you know? And, yeah, but they said that they all they did, did, did have a great time making the movie, though. Yeah, I'm sure it was fun. It's always fun making a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, if you just get a hold of uh, my father now, you'll have, like, the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk to him, you know? Oh, would you? I'm oh, sure yeah. I can arrange something or at least help nudge him in that direction if you like. Oh, absolutely, I would, you know. And, it, yeah, of course, he was on that show where he's a where he's a cowboy in modern 1987. Yeah. What was yeah. it called? Oh, Outlaws, right? Yes. Yes. That's right, yeah. I honest, that's something I don't think I ever saw, actually. Um, I, I never did, too, but I heard about it, yeah. Yeah. I would like to see it at some point. It sounds pretty funny, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that was a trend in those days. They would take these shows and give them absurd premises because they were based on movies that hit at the time, you know? Right, right. But, well, the premise, you know, it also doesn't sound that different in a way from, you know, like Westworld or something, you know? Yeah. Or, I'm a big Westworld um, guy, yeah. Like, in terms of combining genres or... It's definitely something that's been... You know what's a similar project to that um, in terms of the premise is um, The Visitors, which is a, a French comedy that came out in the 80s, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I absolutely love... I adore that film. The Visitors? I mean, I just... The Visitors, yeah. Huh. Because I know there was a Visitors in the 70s that El Elia Kazan directed with James Woods and Steve Rills back. No, no, this is, um, that's, that's not it. No, it's a different one. Huh, okay. There's a few, I think it's on <clears throat> Netflix, actually. Um, I know they also made some, like, The Visitors 2 and 3, I think, but definitely watch the first one. It, um, I mean, I, I love it so much. I laugh so hard when I watch it, especially if you like very body kind of, I do. Comedy, you know, <laughs> like very slapstick kind of stuff. I do. <laughs> um, yeah. The, it's about a knight from like the, the Crusades and his, I guess, what, is it a, a squire? I don't even remember what they're called, but like his kind of stable boy or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, and they, through like a, a series of unfortunate events, they have to go, um, they, they have to try time travel, and they wanted to go, like, just a few days or something into the past, but instead, um, Merlin ends up sending him into the, into the future, which at the time was the, the 80s, and, um, and it's just, it's just so funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'll check that out. Uh, th there was a, a sci-fi movie that came out in the 80s called The Visitants, and that's like the closest I could think of, of like The Visitors for the 80s. Uh, it's a very funny, um, low-budget uh, sci-fi movie. I've had one of the stars on the show and the, the writer-director, Rick Sloan, on the show. Oh, you, you, apparently you managed to get like everyone on your show. <laughs> I, I'm just lucky. 
<laughs> I, I can't. You're on it. like your, you've done like a thousand interviews or something? Yeah, uh, a thousand and twelve today as of you. A thousand and twelve interviews. That's, congratulations. That's incredible. Thank you. I am so damn lucky, yes. How long have you been doing this for? Since May of 2017. Wow. That, that's really wonderful. So was it kind of a slow start at first, and now you're, for a while you've been kind of like picking up steam and it gets easier to to contact people, or? Yeah, so. Was, uh, it, was it like good luck right from the bat? Well, it was good luck from right from the bat, but not like the way I wanted it to be. So I, I wanted to do just horror and sci-fi people, right? And hmm. I would go sometimes a month without getting a horror sci-fi guest. And that went on for a long time. And then I decided I wasn't going to limit myself. I was going to interview everybody in the film world. And then eventually it became uh, stand-up comedians, a little bit later rock musicians. I'm so fucking lucky I get wow. rock musicians now. I love it. <laughs> And then, um, of course, um, sex educators and porn stars and stuff, and just wow. anything that interests me, I have on the show. And okay, it has it has been luck, but it was a slow it was a slow start in that regard that I couldn't get um, that many horror and sci fi people because I didn't have a following at the time. And now I can get pretty much anybody from horror and stuff. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. It is. That it, really is. That's amazing that you did that. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so humbled by it. I really am. Wow. Do you, do you interview... You must have at least one interview a day now. I have uh, sometimes three a day, especially this time of year for uh, Halloween October. I, I have so oh, many. Oh, that's right. Yeah, when January hits, though, I'm going to knock it down to one or two a week, or, or two or three a week, because I just need to take care of, of more priorities and stuff, like my weight, and my mom, she's recovering from uh, some injuries right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's been it's been pretty bad, um, personally, but I'm very blessed with what I have with this show. Mm. Yes, you are. Yes. So, so what? But I know sometimes it's not ahead. every it's not everything that's going right all at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, how did you uh, uh, get into uh, directing? Well, I had um, really since I was uh, a kid, I've been wanting to direct. Um, it was really like, even though I loved acting, I, I felt like. You know that directing would really be like the next level for me I guess you know mm -hmm. um, I had I didn't I wasn't able to do much um, as, a, as a kid in terms of making any projects I didn't have any um, cameras but I, there was a, a few times where um, my my best friend and I would make like um kind of like little stop animations with her parents' camera yeah. toys and stuff, um, which was a lot of fun. And I wrote some little plays, and I, I was actually quite a writer growing up. Um, mm -hmm. But I really didn't have the um, I didn't come across too many opportunities to. Um, to direct it. Of course, it's definitely one of those things where, like, nobody wants to, you know, um, it, it's not some, it's not the kind of opportunity that, like, falls into people's laps, generally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's something you have to, you kind of have to make those opportunities um, happen for yourself. Um, and I didn't have any experience, so, and that's sort of what people base, like, their trust in you as a as a filmmaker on of course is like what you know let me see your reel yeah. <laughs> um so i um i didn't have any of that but i was really passionate about filmmaking and um at one point you know i I'd kind of gotten to the place a place in my life where I was moving away from acting, and I really didn't, even, even though I still wanted to be a filmmaker, I felt like, you know, there wasn't any money in it, and it, it wouldn't really be worth 
um, pursuing in terms of stability and, you know, actually being able to, to support myself and everything like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I thought, you know, I would instead, like, I started pursuing graphic design and I was planning on and studying art and art history and maybe, you know, like, through there, going through more of, like, an art direction perspective, maybe at one point I could get the chance to direct something. Um, but at that, sh- shortly after that, I, um, I started, uh, my mental health has always been, like, a, a huge um, a huge struggle for me, to be honest. And um, around the time where I mm-hmm. was ready to, uh, to transfer, um, I kind of hit like a, a wall and I was having a hard time crawling out. And so uh, my mom actually suggested that I take, just for fun really, uh, an outside screenwriting class. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I, I I really fell in love with it, which I was shocked by. I mean, I I never really paid too much attention to the um, or I never thought of myself as a screenwriter at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but in fact, it's one of my favorite parts of the filmmaking process. Now looking back, um, at any rate, so I started writing, and then she had all these ideas and. And we were kind of riffing off each other, and um, we started to come up with this concept uh, for a film. And she really wanted to do it. You know, she wanted she was getting back into acting, and I was, you know, just really so happy to be to be writing and and to be doing all of this and exploring um, this other aspect of of uh, storytelling. And so we started to team up um, as, as screenwriters I and mean, uh, one thing kind of led to another, you know, she came across some, um, she, she like inherited a very small amount of money, but she decided that what she wanted to do with it was, was make this film. Mm-hmm. And one thing really led to another. We ended up, you know, just putting it all together with um, people we knew from the industry and um, people we had been been working with. A lot of the actors, we actually wrote characters, we wrote our characters sort of around the actors that we were planning on working with. And, you know, just kind of learning as we were going one step at a time. Um, But so far, it's, it's falling into place, you know, slower than, than I'm sure, like, an old veteran would go. But <laughs> but it's coming along. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know if that answered your question exactly. No, that's it's okay, because I, I wanted to ask you next, are you, are you a big uh, horror fan? You know, um, when I started this, this process because from the get-go it was always going to be like a a thriller horror like supernatural horror you know mm-hmm. um and I've always liked I've always liked supernatural horror like, definitely it's one of my preferred um like sub-genres within horror you know right uh but I never considered myself really like a horror fan um you know because so much of it, it like there's a lot of I've always been much more into to like I don't know like drama dramedies and indies and um, I I was previously not I don't know I just I'm not like a violent person I I'm not that into like you know I I don't know like I don't play video games I don't do any of that kind of stuff yeah um and I've always what interested me with filmmaking especially you know coming it from coming coming to it from like an actor's perspective is like the psychology of something, you know, is, is, and the influence of, um, the influence of what we're making on, like, the psychology of the audience, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but at any rate, I, of course, knew that I would have to, you know, start to sort of, um, bulk up my, my knowledge of the, the genre, and so I started 
watching some of the classics, you know, that I hadn't previously exposed myself to and um, and revisiting some of the ones that I, you know, always had loved but I hadn't seen in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really started to feel like, I, I mean, I feel like I really overlooked it as a genre. And now I, I really... I really adore it, honestly. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely some projects that I'm not crazy about. They're not my thing. But um, but as a whole, I feel like it's, it's like one of the most developed and influential and um, one, of, one of the genres that as an artist you can have, you can do the most with. Um, it, ha- it tends to be the most visual, you know, you have the opportunity to to um, work with with messages in a way that in other genres might come out as uh, like very uh, not necessarily pretentious, but um, a bit articulate. Um, just. Mm. You're you're able to broach subjects that otherwise, I think audiences would be closed off to or not interested in viewing from an entertainment from a purely entertainment perspective. Oh, okay, yes. Um, you know, there's much more there's much more opportunities to to do like a social commentary uh, without it being obviously a, like social commentary. You know what I mean? Without only people that are, who want to see those kinds of movies would, would watch it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so in those ways, I think it's it's really incredible. And then, of course, just as a, as a viewer, as a, when I'm an audience member, there's like, there's very little that, there's very few films that, that make me feel that I that are so visceral and that um, move me in in such an extreme way. Um, maybe comedy or or really really good dramas, but usually dramas. Honestly, I kind of these days I just sort of shut down. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but in terms of consistently, always like I, I'm 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 honestly a huge scaredy cat. Like I am the person. You know, everyone else in the theater is like, you know, just kind of like watching the horror or whatever, and you know, this jump scare, and everyone laughs, and I scream bloody murder, and yeah. everyone laughs even harder because of the I'm the girl who screamed. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it definitely has an effect on me, um, and I, I find that really remarkable and and inspiring. Um, you know, there's so few, there's so few projects now that that are able to. Um, that are able to, to bring that amount of, of energy and um, and emotional presence um, that are able to raise that out of an audience. And, and so many, um, so much of our lives now, we don't really get to experience on a moment-to-moment basis in a way where we're living in that kind of heightened sense even you know even if the world is crazy and, and you know, everything is burning and uh, you know, there's right whatever it is you know there's the pandemic and everything we we're so used to to shutting down yeah. just so that we can keep going just so that we can survive right that we don't get to have like these um, We, we don't get to have these experiences where we um, can fully em- embrace in the moment what it is we're experiencing in a way where we let it touch us and affect us, right? Because mm-hmm. you let, to let something touch us and affect us to the level that, that we do when we're watching a film, we probably wouldn't be able to keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I just, just I just think horror now is just it's too dark. It's not fun like it used to be because you got all these these um, these wokesters in the industry, you know, uh, uh, trying to 
you know, correct all the quote-unquote mistakes that were made in 80s horror films with, you know, women, you know, being brutalized and all this stuff. And to me, if you want to make a horror movie where a woman is brutalized, I think the best thing to do is have her, you know, kick the killer's ass, you know, for, for um, redemption there. Hmm. You know? Like the revenge genre. Exactly. Or, yeah, you like those, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do too, actually. I mean, I know that they're kind of, you know, looked down upon, but, it, yeah, I do. I enjoy them, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean... Um, but I I have to say, I really love a lot of the, the horror films that have been coming out recently. I think they're... Um, the incredible, very moving. Um, the Babadook. Have you seen that? Which one? The Babadook. No. Um, I heard about it, but no, uh, I haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah. Oh God, you have to see it. It's so good. Yeah. Um, it, that was a huge inspiration for us when when we were writing. I I remember mm-hmm. having a really hard time vocalizing to to other people what it the sort of the kind of film that we were trying to make, and um, it was just it was just hard to find examples because often you, you do need to have um, examples in order to to illustrate to people what you're going for. Although if it's never been done before, people can't visualize it, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, once I saw that, it definitely like something clicked for me in terms of being able to. Um, to articulate what it was that we were going for, but it, it's, yeah, it, I highly recommend it. It's so, um, it's chilling. It really is. And it's beautifully shot and the performances are amazing. And if you like, you know, like creepy children movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> Village of the Damned is a favorite of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Creepy children on like, possibly haunted house but maybe it's just psychosis you know (laughs) (laughs) um it's got all that going on for it so yeah what's it like working with your mom um it was well there was like different stages of um you know there's different um there's different stages that you go through in order to to fully realize a film and um, every stage has its own um, you'll find that you have your own like strengths and weaknesses or things that you really enjoy about it and things that you're like I could really pass this off to somebody else yeah. um, so and, and because of that really every single um, part of the, the of making the uncanny um, just as every single part was different for me, it was also diff- our, our, my relationship with my mother was different, um, and our, our working relationship was different depending on what stage of the process we were in. Um, the writing was like, I don't know, it was like cutting through butter. It was so easy yeah. um, in terms of naturally working together. Um, the the film ma- making itself was like the the production process. It was really challenging. It was it, I I mean I love doing it and I love working with my mom, but at the same time, it's um, you know I'll be really honest. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's coming from like you know the the perspective of a mother's daughter or a mother's child, mm-hmm. really hard to watch, you know, it's hard to watch your parents suffer, even if you know that it's not real. Yeah. Even if you know that, um, that they're doing this because they want to, you know, or that you're doing this together because you want to, it's still really, like, it is a kind of unnerving. And so, um, on that sort of, like, personal but also very, like, primal level, it was really hard for me to get over that. You know, like, I think if it was a comedy or something, that would mm-hmm. never have been an issue. But because I was watching her go to these really dark places and and because the, the film was 
as the nature of the film was so personal, um, it was... Uh, at first, I didn't even think I was going to be able to do it, honestly. Yeah. Um, because I, I just... I didn't think I could um, put her in that kind of situation, you know? Or mm -hmm. watch her go through that kind of situation. Um, even now, like, I feel like kind of emotional talking about it. It's, um, it's, you know, it's not something that, if you love somebody, uh, especially on a familial level, you don't ever want to watch them go through those things, you know? Oh, um, yeah. And so, so that, that for me was, was the hardest part. <laughs> it it's it's taken me uh it took me a while to 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 be to get comfortable being friends with your mother because she's so intimidating on screen that really yeah she's so menacing and in creature that it just i don't know it just took me it just took me a while you know i mean i got to have bagels with her in la last year with my mother you know and Aww. And I could just, you know, see that, 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 that sweet side of her, you know, in, in, in person and stuff, you know. And uh, we've gotten to the point now, you know, where we can have a, a private phone conversation with no boundaries and just have fun talking, you know. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's a, a big sweetheart. Um, yeah. Yeah, and she loves to talk. She's, she's definitely a talker. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine. Well, I guess when my mother is angry. I, I know she can be intimidating, and I've certainly, you know, she was doing a lot of work with um, with kids in the system and everything like that. And um, yeah, we 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 bonded she, over that. When they upset her, she she apparently was somebody to well, she's not, she's not somebody to upset. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, we bonded over that because I lived in a, um, a disabled group home uh, for a while, a couple actually, and we we bonded over the bullshit that that could happen in them. She didn't know that, it could, know. that she didn't know it could happen to adults too. And I was like, yeah, it could happen to anybody in those in those government programs. You know, they're they're bullshit is what they are. Yeah, they are. They are. There's that that all that whole. Well, you shouldn't even call it an industry, but in fact, it sort of has become one. Um, Everything has, uh, yeah. It's, it's really upsetting to to find out the the level of um, just more morally reprehensible things that happen there. Yeah, really, really bad stuff, yeah. and yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm out of there and stuff. And I hope, um, yeah, I'm sure. in, I hope in the future it, it, it changes, you know, it already has. I mean, the, the, the second home that I was in, I don't know, the first one, um, the first home I was in, they, they, uh, they got cracked down, uh, because they were doing the human trafficking behind the scenes. So, wow. yeah. So dark. Very dark. It, it should be a movie too. <laughs> Did she tell you that that's the the next project that we're working on? She did mention something about that. Yeah, I can't yeah, remember because yeah. I, I do so many podcasts. I can't remember everything, but I vaguely remember her mentioning something about that. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be um, a series um, revolving around the group home. Love it, love it! I can't wait to see it. Oh. <laughs> Any, any hopes of um, getting anything um, done after COVID it has been come to a halt of any projects that uh, you want to do? Uh, well, it's just that, that next one that we're working on, and I have, um, I have a few other projects that I want to work on um, alone uh, without any partners. <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll see what happens with the industry, though, right? I mean, I know yeah. that, you know, we're we're in the final stages of, like, post-post with the uncanny, but who knows um, what will be happening in terms of um, how it's actually released. Obviously, we wanted to hit the, the festival circuit, but now, you know, they're like, all the festivals are online, and so... Mm -hmm. It's really up in the air in terms of what's going to happen and what's the best way to approach um, 
getting a project out there and for for people to be making new projects, you know, it's everything is like being redone now. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have all these scripts that I've I've written or outlined that I that I wanted to uh, I had one yeah. I wanted I had one I wrote a horror movie I wanted to try to get done this year until COVID hit I was uh, gonna ask people for money to get it made but I have to wait now um, it's a horror movie I'm very passionate about that I wrote uh, when I first got up here and then um, this one I, I've outlined a little bit of it I need to go a little bit more in depth with it. I want to, um, I'm friends with the founding members of the Groundlings, you know, the comedy troupe out in L.A.? Yes. The yep. Groundlings? I'm friends with the, um, with, the, with the founding members. I want to write a movie that pays homage to them about a, a sketch and improv group trying to form in Hollywood in the early 70s. And I have all these, great, I have all these great ideas for it. And, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah. And I want to hire people who are actually in the Groundlings or Second City to be in the movie playing these characters and I don't want any of the sketches I don't want I don't want to put down the um descriptions of the sketches I want them just to improv it and film it you know because they can do that you know and so um yeah so I want to get that done in the future and there's so many others you know that I want to get made you know I, I want to be a horror host I, I tried to shoot a pilot last year and the the guy that I uh, was gonna have produce it fucked me over, and then um, I was gonna do try it again this year, and then COVID hit, and now m me and my friend um, we're gonna try to make a second go at it uh, sometime next year. So, fingers crossed on that. Yeah, we shall we shall see, and stuff. So we gotta play my secret silly game. Your secret silly game? Yes, this is. A uh, very fun game. It's a series of silly slumber party questions. I played it. Uh, oh. I played it with your mother. <laughs> and, okay. And so this is not win or lose, just uh, fun. And how this works is, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. Okay. Okay, Clara, are you ticklish? Yes. <laughs> Tommy, are you ticklish? Yes. I've been known to hit some people in the groin. I'm so ticklish. <laughs> I I almost took my my uh, stepfather's nose off, off with my teeth. I'm so ticklish. Completely by accident. <laughs> you, you, wait a second. You, um, you, you, almost, you almost hit him in the nose with your feet, you said? My, my teeth. Uh, he was tickling me, and I, you know, when you, when you are tickled you kind of spasm and you're laughing and yeah. have these like these buck teeth you know <laughs> those like free braces and uh and yeah my my i just i got i i almost took off his nose <laughs> <laughs> i have buck teeth and i already have a chip too so i'll never tickle you <laughs> oh. okay fair enough um, is your belly button an innie or an outie? My belly button is an innie. Is your belly button an innie or an outie? I have a very deep innie. Do you? Yes. Yes. Yeah, mine is pretty deep too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can hear an echo in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I saw an... I was watching a show the other day, and um, the girl on it ha had like a an outfit where her midriff was showing, and mm -hmm. it was so bizarre because she didn't seem to have like an innie or an outie. It was almost like she was an alien. Like she, I couldn't see her belly button, and it really kind of freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, some people are like that. I've noticed. <laughs> Alfred, really, I've never seen that before. Well, Alfred Hitchcock allegedly didn't have one, and I'm trying to get his granddaughter on what? the show so I can ask her that. <laughs> Yeah, you need to verify that. That that sort of makes sense for Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, what color are your toenails painted? Oh my God! You know what? I have been ever since um, COVID or, yeah. broke out. I have been like on a, a beauty diet detox, and I have not painted my toenails since. Wow. Yeah. Same here. Um, they're usually, 
Oh, oh, your mother will tell you. She, she saw them blue-green when we saw each other last year. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I, um, I used to, like, love the, the sort of different colors, especially when I was a kid, like all those hard candies. Mm-hmm. I love them, the, the, the light sky blue and turquoise and everything. But now I'm always going for, like, a kind of vintage cherry red. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It goes with everything. I don't want to think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say is your best personality trait? Oh, God, my best personality trait. Um, probably loyalty. Loyalty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. Very good one. Yeah, it just... Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a good one, right? I mean, I certainly like other people when they're loyal. It's very <laughs> I appreciate good. appreciate it. It's very good. And then for me... Uh, yes, yes. What is your best personality trait? My sense of empathy and that I have no filter. Mm. Those are both really good. Yeah, I have a, I have a really... I, I was going to say something around empathy or something like that, but honestly, sometimes I feel like it's debilitating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like if you're an empath, yes. it can be, um, yeah, the, it, the world is an extreme place for an empath. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? A stinky smell that makes me gag? No. Um, I mean, this, I, I'm definitely... I'm actually a pretty sensitive to smells, but in general, I can't th- like I can't think of anything that would make me gag. No, really. Uh, but I do have some weird smells that I secretly really am into that I'm probably not supposed to be as into as I am. <laughs> like l- like um... <laughs> like I secretly really love the smell of like Comet and Ajax powder. Okay, that's not that's not weird. That's not weird. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't know. It it um, it's very. I find it extremely soothing somehow. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Is there a smell that um, elicits uh, either the the gag reflex or some other? Either, um, um, it's either farts or feet. Farts or feet. Yes. Now, if it was farty feet, yeah, I mean, you would just, you'd be hugging the toilet all night long. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, neither of those are very good, for sure. Yeah, your mother said something like uh, it was French cheese and, like, it smelled like, you know, something between your toes or something. <laughs> right, right, yeah. That's, that's what it smells like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did... Did she? Did she tell you I like to tell jokes? Uh, I have heard that you like to tell dirty jokes. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Well, she she actually recommended that I I find a dirty joke to share with you, and I was like trying to find one, and I just felt like you know all of these aren't very. I don't know. I just I wasn't very impressed by them. I was like, he's probably heard all of them before. He's probably said at least he's probably said them. It's okay. <laughs> um, but. The fact that you don't like stinky cheese, and or the fact that you don't like feed, and your mom, my mom was talking about stinky cheese, does remind me of a story, that a kind of dirty story. Oh, it's okay. I don't mind the stories, but not actual, you know, being there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, it's just it's kind of a funny, dirty story. So, mm-hmm. um, my the, like a, a family friend of ours uh, was was friends with a French prostitute. Mm-hmm. And um, she was kind of a, like a call, like a you know escort call girl. Had ex- like a rich clients and everything, and she had a one regular client who had a fetish for feet. Mm-hmm. Um, but they weren't just it wasn't just like any feet; it was stinky feet. Right. <laughs> 
um, like really, really stinky feet. And he would ask her, you know, not to not to bathe, not to wash her feet, and yeah. especially before he came over and everything. Um, and, you know, she, of course, would say fine because, you know, that's what she was getting paid to do. But secretly, she couldn't put, you know, she couldn't put up with that. And she had other clients, too, of course, and so she's going to be washing her feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to... Um, to hide the fact that she was washing her feet and still be able to, you know, keep him as a, as a client, she started purchasing really stinky, feety smelling French cheese and, and rubbing it all over her feet before he came over. And apparently he never, he was never able, he never suspected a thing. <laughs> you know, I think that's the story she told me. <laughs> oh, that's the story she told you? I think so. Yeah. I, I vaguely oh, remember that's so it. funny. Okay. Yeah. Oh, damn. Now I don't have a story. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I got the same jokes that I tell her all the time, you know, like, uh, you know, the, there was a, you know, the the old woman that lived in his shoe. She had so many kids, she didn't know what to do. What did her right leg say to her left leg? I don't know. What did, what did, what did they say? Nothing. They never met. You get it? No. It means she has so many kids that, you know, she doesn't close her legs. Oh! Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have another, another okay. dirty, dirty story, a personal one. Okay. I love personal stories. Go ahead. Okay, so when I was in seventh grade, um, you know, that's like usually... It, around, you know, I was like, I just recently got my period. Yes. And, um, uh, it was that summer and I was invited to a pool party and I had my period. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, my mom was like, you can't go to a pool party and swim wearing a pad. I hadn't used a tampon yet. Right. Yeah. Like, you can't, like, but it's not going to work out. Trust me. And uh, so she gave me a box of tampons, and she was like, have fun. <laughs> and I'm like, well, okay, so how do you use these? And she's like, you know, you just, you just stick them up there. <laughs> you, just, you just put it up. Like, what do you mean you just put it up? Like, you know, you'll figure it out. You just, you just put it up. Uh, so I, you know, I went to the bathroom, and I was, like, trying to figure out what to do. And um, the instructions that usually come in those boxes, um, she must have, like, thrown out or something, but they weren't in there. Mm -hmm. And um, with the little information that I had in regards to how to actually uh, utilize a tampon, mm -hmm. um, I left the applicator inside. So I'm sure you can imagine <laughs> that this was extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but, and so basically I, I ended up, I like, I spent the whole pool party, like, I, well, I don't even think I, I don't think I swam, but I spent the whole pool party, like varying degrees of like extreme discomfort and pain and waddling around like a penguin for however many hours I was there. <laughs> 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 Not having absolutely not a clue that whatever I, you know, that I had done something so um, mm. <laughs> completely, uh, you know, not the right, that, that I was like completely, I, uh, what's the word, ignorant of ignorant. Yeah, that's <laughs> the a good word. that I had actually um, used the product in the wrong way and that that's why I was in like, such excruciating pain and I thought it was just a really terrible product and why would anyone ever... Use it. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible, but yeah. I mean, I guess that's 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 middle school for you. I'm sure everyone has those kinds of stories. It was it was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> oh yeah, um, when I was 12, I fingered a girl for the first time and I made her squirt. Oh really? Yes. Oh wow, that's um. Huh. I I, I that's impressive for a 12 year old. 
I know everyone I tell it to tells me that, especially the girls, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like. I wonder if that that that's a regular thing for her. I don't know, cause cause I'll tell you. So her mother and my father grew up together, and we were at uh, we we had this shopping mall that had an arcade, uh, which closed down about a month after. Um, we we did this and uh, we were playing on one of those sit the sit down games you know the race car games you know and she said hey I got no panties on and I was like really it's like yeah you want to see and she said you can put your hand up there right and I was like can I do anything else and she's like sure go ahead you know and I I had seen porno so I knew what I was doing pretty much you know and uh -huh. it was Sunday it was dead no one was there and the guy uh, behind the counter was not very tentative he was reading or whatever. And so um, we quietly did that, and she squirted. The seat was all wet. <laughs> and so I was nervous as fuck. My heart was racing like we were going to get caught, get in trouble. And so we, we just we laughed it off, and then we just got the hell out of there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then um, about, 14, about 14 years later, we reconnected on Facebook. And, um, oh, yeah? Yeah, and uh, she was coming. She was coming back home because she was gone for a while. I think she was in L.A. or San Diego or something, somewhere in that region. And um, we were we we uh, were going to get together. We were actually going to um, have some sex and everything and go all the way. Oh. But um, uh, so I went to this jewelry um, gallery opening that her mother was doing, and her mother is a is a milf, and so. Oh. She, so she wanted to um, spend the night with me, and I did it. And so um, she got je wow. she got jealous. But then I found out that um, she got engaged um, between the time she came back and and um, this was the, the, that night was the first night I'd seen her in years, you know. And so yeah. her credibility was low already. And so yeah, I haven't talked to her since. But from what I've been told, she's divorced now. <laughs> Oh really? <laughs> yeah, she's divorced. Yeah, and I actually knew her husband too, as it turns out. Oh. And so yeah, she got jealous that I spent the night with her mom. So whatever. Well, yeah, that. <laughs> I, I I think that would probably make a lot of people jealous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So you're a ladies' man. I wouldn't say I'm a ladies' man. I'm just lucky, is what I am. <laughs> I, I I would agree with that, yeah. <laughs> I, I I use the words of my, my friend Dee Wallace, who I'm happy to say is a friend also. Her her words are, I recommend naivete, because naivete will get you anywhere. And that's what I've done, basically. Huh. I've been naive, and I've gotten lucky. That's, um, that's a, a very good tip there. I think probably applicable to almost any situation. Exactly, exactly. Because we're all learning. I mean, we don't learn everything, you know, at a certain age point. It, it's a, it's a it's a process that goes on for our entire lives. Life. Yeah. We're always learning, always. So okay, here's a couple more jokes before okay. we wrap this up. Okay, what did the elephant say to the naked man? <gasps> oh fuck! Wait. <laughs> No, I, I, I think I saw a joke that was like this, but I don't remember. It's a naked man, right? Yes. Said, yes. But it's a blind elephant, say, to the naked man? No, no, no. It's not blind. It's not blind. What does the elephant say to the naked, to the naked man? Uh, how do you breathe through that? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> you knew it. You knew it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> that was actually one of the ones I was going to read to you. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And then... Um, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> you know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? Men will look for the golf ball. Yes, it takes a man 20 minutes to find the golf ball, is the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, here's one your mom told me. You probably She probably told it to you. You know the difference between a man's dick and a Rubik's Cube? Uh, I feel like I can kind of go, I can see where this is going. 
thing, but no, tell yeah. me. The more you play with it, the harder it gets. Ah. <laughs> so that's not the difference, though. That's going to be what, what, what's similar about them, though, right? Yes, that's the, the difference between them, yeah. And, and the way she described it, it was so charming, you know, she's trying to pronounce it with her French accent. <laughs> I loved it. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> well, Clara, I thank you so much for coming on today. You are awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yes. I'm, um, I'm so happy that my first interview was with you. Oh, really? You've never been interviewed before? No, I never have. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really quite nervous. Those bastards. Well, it was my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I definitely, yeah, I, it, was, it was a lot of fun, so was a lot of fun and you're always welcome to come back and i would love to anytime okay and you uh, stay safe out there and um have a, a well it's almost nighttime so have a great night oh thank you yes happy friday yes happy friday <laughs> <laughs> all right take care okay you too bye-bye bye well there you have it clara gabrielle Ain't she a sweetheart? She is a chip off of the old block. I loved talking to her. Uh, Marie, you did a fine job there. You did a fine job. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!